Have you heard about the dangers of having too much oxalate and wondered if you should go on a low oxalate diet or avoid high oxalate foods? If you wondered, where does all this oxalate come from? Is it mostly from our diet or do we make it? If you wondered, how does the body absorb oxalate and how does it get rid of it? What organs are involved? And finally, if you wondered, what can I do? Is the low oxalate diet the best option to make your body better at handling oxalate? Well, in today's video, we're gonna cover all of this based on a review from 2022 titled Oxalate Homeostasis, which covers everything we know currently about oxalate. So to begin with, where does oxalate come from? There are two primary sources in your body. The first is exogenous oxalate consumption. This is directly consuming oxalate from your diet found in different fruits and vegetables. Now, the other alternative source is endogenous oxalate production, meaning you make it primarily in the liver, primarily from um, precursor amino acids that can come either from your diet or breakdown of your tissues such as collagen, muscle, etc., etc. So when we look at it, what constitutes more of the oxalate in our body? It turns out endogenous production in the liver is far more of a concern than dietary oxalate in healthy individuals under normal circumstances. What do we mean by this? So 50 to 80% of the oxalate in your body in a healthy individual consuming a normal diet, not shooting it into any fad diets or you know juicing things like spinach or beets, et cetera, et cetera. These people are producing 50 to 80% of their oxalate in their liver, meaning they are consuming 20 to 50% oxalate in their diet. Now, of course, this can get skewed if you kind of go crazy and juice spinach and beets um, and consume a lot of high oxalate foods, clearly, the exogenous consumption of oxalate will make a bigger um, draw of the total oxalate pool. But based on the studies we have, even in a high oxalate diet, you don't even get quite to 50% unless you're not consuming enough calcium, which we'll discuss why that is in a bit. So when we look at oxalate in our body, it's primarily being produced in, in our liver. Now, if we look at metabolically unhealthy people, they are gonna produce even more oxalate in their liver. People with prediabetes, type two diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, these people produce a lot more oxalate in their body because of dysfunction that's happening in the liver. And so we will actually see probably even a slightly higher um, percentage than we see in healthy individuals, which can you know exceed 80% of your total oxalate exposure. So now let's kind of dig into how the body absorbs and eliminates oxalate and then discuss some of these dietary precursors and move on to what we should do about it. Now we're gonna cover how the body handles oxalate. From the review article, we're looking at figure one. This deals with, at the top, physiological oxalate homeostasis, meaning you are getting rid of all the excess oxalate you're making. So to begin with, we consume a dietary oxalate. This enters the GI tract, and it is able to be absorbed provided it's soluble oxalate between the cells in our intestine. However, it doesn't stop here. There's actually a transporter called the solute carrier family 26 member six, or we'll just refer to it as the oxalate transporter that spits it right back into the intestine. This is called fecal oxalate excretion. Now, under certain circumstances, um, inflammation in the gut, which can inhibit this transporter, um, inter excess intestinal permeability, and various other factors, you can actually end up absorbing more oxalate into your bloodstream, and this will begin circulating into plasma oxalate. Now, to get rid of this, we're going to send it towards the kidneys. The kidneys contain the same transporter, which aid in getting rid of oxalate through the urine, which is where we get rid of around 90% of the oxalate in the body. Now, this is simply from dietary oxalate. We can also consume dietary oxalate precursors that can then make it to the liver and get converted into oxalate going through this same process. So in the liver, we have production of endogenous oxalate that can be a product of something such as breakdown of collagen or various tissues in the body. These uh, precursors get sent to the liver and then converted into glyoxalate primarily, which will feed into making oxalate. Additionally, if you have type 2 diabetes, chronic hyperglycemia, you see the same thing, enhanced glyoxalate production. And since um, glyoxalate is the precursor to oxalate, you can see enhanced oxalate production as well. So we have these dietary precursors, we have breakdown of tissues in the body, all feeding into this plasma oxalate pool. Now again, some of it can get dumped into the feces through fecal oxalate excretion due to the transporter SLC26A6. Alternatively, it can go to the kidney where it gets excreted in the urine, and here we are under oxalate homeostasis. However, 
Under certain such situations, you can actually end up absorbing more oxalate or creating more oxalate in your body than your kidney can deal with and that your, um, uh, that your intestine can deal with. So you end up causing major problems. This can lead to increased vas vascular calcification, chronic kidney disease, bone deposits of oxalate, um, enteric hyperoxaluria, which is excess oxalate in the intestine, um, and then of course coronary artery disease due to the vascular calcification. So there's a lot of problems that can go on with excess oxalate in the body. It's ideal that our gut, our liver, and our kidney are functioning properly. In addition, it's important that we have a microbiome that can help aid us in this process. The microbiome plays, plays a pretty big role, um, not only in helping break down oxalate with um, uh, bacteria that can degrade oxalate, but also specifically with the oxalobacter forming genes, uh, it can actually cause your body to pull more oxalate out of your blood and into your gut due to a, a secretagogue, some sort of molecule that it secretes that actually enhances enhances the activity of this transporter that pulls oxalate out of the blood and the intestine. Additionally, short chain fatty acids do the same thing. So if you have a pool of bacteria in your gut that create a large amount of short chain fatty acids, you can actually enhance oxalate secretion as well. And from what we see in terms of uh, how the microbiome plays a role in helping us deal with oxalate, it's not simply having one member of the microbiome, such as oxalobacter form genes. It has to do with having communities that can fully break it down and enhance your ability to get rid of it so that it cannot become a problem. Here we have major sources of oxalate that can come either from the diet or internally produced by your liver, endogenous and exogenous oxalate. Glycolate, Hydroxyproline, glycine, glyoxal, and glyoxalate are the primary endogenous oxalate precursors. Most of these converge down into glyoxalate, which can then get converted into oxalate. However, it's important to point out hydroxyproline and glycine are actually something that you can consume in your diet. Things like bone broth, or if you're consuming foods, uh, you know, say you're having a chicken wing and you're, and you're consuming the collagen, that will break down into uh, these amino acids and, and just um, um, for interest's sake, uh, hydroxyproline does seem to be one of the primary precursors to oxalate that you're going to get in your diet. It's around 15%. But ultimately, particularly when you're dealing with something like type, type 2 diabetes, um, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, glyoxalate is going to be a major precursor to oxalate. And this is due to the liver just simply not working properly. Now, exogenous sources, these, uh, these aren't just exogenous sources, um, these are very specific dietary oxalates. So these contain soluble oxalate in them. Uh, for vegetables, we have spinach, rhubarb, beets, sweet potato, and shaga mushrooms. Cocoa powder, coffee, and some types of tea. Soy, legumes, rice bran, wheat germ, cornmeal, whole grain flour. Star fruit, guava, watermelon, raspberries. Chia seeds, peanuts, sesame seeds, almonds, amaranth hazelnuts, pistachios, and of course, vitamin C, um, ascorbic acid. Now, it's important to point out that it doesn't mean that if you consume any of these foods uh, that it's going to lead to a problem with oxalate. It means if you are loading your diet all with foods that are super high in oxalate, and generally speaking, you're not really going to do this uh, simply by eating whole foods, like making a salad with spinach. However, if you decide you're going to juice some uh, spinach, uh, with beets or even just blend them up into a smoothie and of course you're going to toss in um, maybe some chia seeds for fiber and some peanuts or almond butter. Uh, dealing with these heavily processed foods that can really concentrate oxalate in your diet are a major problem. One thing to consider too is the other components of your diet. For example, if you're not consuming adequate calcium, this can cause a major problem because calcium can actually bind to oxalate in the gut, preventing you from absorbing it. Additionally, fat Fat plays a major role. A higher fat diet actually prevents this kind of complexing with oxalate and calcium, and it also increases the amount of bile that can allow you to absorb some oxalate as well. So um, both uh, consuming too little calcium and consuming too much fat can actually make a an oxalate problem, particularly if your diet is loaded with oxalate. And again, we can go back to these, um, uh, like say almond butter um, or even peanut butter that are very ground, high fat, giving you a concentration 
concentrated source of oxalate with a, a fat load that can actually prevent binding with calcium or magnesium in your digestive tract. This can actually increase and enhance your absorption of oxalate, something you do not want to do. But again, keep in mind, if you're eating some nuts here or there, um, th this is not something you're really going to have to worry about. These are the kind of people that are going to be doing all of these things bad at once. It's not to say that if you're in a situation where maybe you have greater intestinal, per intestinal permeability because you've been drinking alcohol, maybe it's not a great idea to also throw down a huge oxalate load at the same time. So now that we've covered everything that's kind of technical about the paper, what, what can you use from this? Well, first and foremost, if you are consuming a high load of dietary oxalate, meaning you are doing some crazy stuff like juicing spinach and beets, you're going to want to stop doing that. Stick to a whole foods diet. If you're going to eat nuts, eat nuts. Don't eat nut butters and nut flours that you can gorge on that would give you too much oxalate. If you have an inflammatory gut conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, et cetera, et cetera, you may want to knock back on the amount of oxalate you consume. When you are consuming a diet that may have a little more oxalate in it, you want to make sure that you are consuming adequate calcium and magnesium. It can bind to the oxalate and prevent you from absorbing it. Alternatively, lowering your fat intake because fat, in, uh, fat intake interferes with that process of the binding uh, to oxalate to calcium and magnesium. And don't be concerned if you're consuming oxalate, you're going to build a microbiome that can break it down. That means that those minerals would become bioavailable in the colon where your microbiome is. So you're not just wasting uh, these minerals by putting them down. Again, if you're going to consume them, consume them at every meal. Don't just take a supplement at the beginning of the day. That's not going to help at all. Alternatively, you can look towards mineral waters that have a lot of magnesium in them because that will help um, with your meals bind that excess oxalate. Next, if you're drinking a ton of alcohol and you suspect you have uh, kidney issues, um, anything, again, that's going to inflame the intestine is going to make you absorb more oxalate by inhibiting that transporter that gets oxalate out of the blood and into the gut or into the urine. So make sure um, if you have inflammatory conditions or you're doing inflammatory things, you may want to cut back on the oxalate while you do that. Next, what do we do about production? Well, first and foremost, be metabolically healthy. Um, keep in mind though, if you are not metabolically healthy and your idea is I'm going to cut out oxalate because I don't want to absorb a lot of it, if you shift that consumption away from plant foods and more towards meat, you're going to be providing your body with more of those oxalate precursors that the liver can then turn into oxalate. Keep that in mind. A lot of people think when they're doing a carnivore diet that when they kind of get an exacerbation of the symptoms they believe to be due to oxalate, they assume that since they're not consuming oxalate that they're getting it out of their tissues, they're doing something called dumping. But fact uh, of the matter is, if you're consuming a lot more glycine, hydroxyproline, et cetera, et cetera, you're going to likely begin producing more glyoxalate, which will get converted to oxalate, particularly if you are metabolically unhealthy. Other things you can do um, with your diet is just maintain a, a healthy weight. Um, if you are consuming a lot of um, alcohol, limit that. That can kind of impair the um, uh, liver function and lead to more uh, glyoxalate production leading to oxalate. And finally, the, the thing is, if you, you believe that reducing the amount of oxalate in your diet is better for you, but I, I, based on all the evidence we have in humans and in other animals, um, consuming more oxalate makes your microbiome more effective at breaking it down. Keeping in mind as well, if you are able to build up a community that has ox oxalobacter form of genes in it, you can actually pull a lot more oxalate out of your blood as well because it will turn on this transporter and then you'll attract even more microbes such as lactobacillus, bifidobacterium, and um, streptococcus that can actually break down glyoxalate or break down oxalate uh, and prevent you uh, from getting too much production. Any excess production can actually be dealt with in the liver and eliminated properly. Another thing you can take into consideration, short chain fatty acids actually enhance the effect of this transporter. So consuming fiber um, and actually consuming carbohydrate in general, I don't think I would necessarily go towards the sugar end of things, but consuming a um, complex carbohydrate carbohydrate diet that contains complex polysaccharides that we don't break down all the way and that can make it to the intestine will produce these short chain fatty acids to make it more efficient of pulling oxalate out of the blood and into the gut. Now, would a, um, a, a butyrate supplement uh, help in that regards? Uh, possibly. Uh, butyrate wasn't the most effective uh, short chain fatty acid. Acetate and propionate were better. So uh, ideally, you're just going to kind of consume a higher fiber diet. Now, Let's say you think you've got a problem with oxalate right now. Should you just jump into a higher fiber diet? 
absolutely not. It will not be fun for you. If you are coming from a low oxalate diet, um, whether it be something like carnivore or even just a regular um, omniv omnivorous diet that is lower in oxalate, you are going to wanna slowly but surely add it in so that you can build up uh, this uh, microbial machinery that can break it down and help you pull it out of your body. Ultimately, if you wanna be efficient at processing oxalate, you need to consume it in your diet. And if you're not going nuts, you're probably going to be perfectly fine at processing oxalate. Certainly, if um, you don't have the, the micro biome to do that you're going to want to tread lightly and there is certainly a possibility that you may not even be able to build up that microbiome however it's important to point out we need to limit inflammation in the gut we need to build a healthy gut and then we can worry about building these microbial communities later that is ultimately your best bet in becoming an efficient oxalate processing machine that covers basically everything we have to talk about on oxalate you can access the uh, article um, it's not full text but you can get it if you know what i mean um, by looking at the references section in the description of this video if you have any questions please put them down in the comment section um, we're going to make it um, a little easier to access this we're going to break it up into parts so you can access each individual uh, part of the video so you can just jump to the certain areas you want so thank you very much for listening in and take care